Hello, we are on chapter 36 of On the Banks of Plum Creek, and it's called Prairie Winter. Next day, the storm was even worse. It could not have been seen through the windows, for snow squished so thickly against the, them that the glass was like a white glass. All around the house, the wind was howling. When Pa started to the stable now, snow swirled thick into the lean-to, and outdoors was a wall of whiteness. He had, he took down a coil of rope from a nail in the lean-to. I'm afraid to try it without something guiding me back, he said. With this rope tied to the far end of the clothesline, I ought to reach the stable. They waited, frightened, till Pa came back. The wind had taken almost all the milk out of the pail, and Pa had to thaw by the stove before he could talk. He had felt his way along the clothesline fastened to the lean-to until he came to the clothesline post. Then he tied an end of his rope to the post and went on, unwinding the rope from his arm as he went. He could not see anything but the whirling snow. Suddenly something hit him and it was the stable wall. He felt along until he came to the door and there he fastened the end of the rope. So he did the chores and came back holding on to the rope. All day the storm lasted. The windows were white and the wind never stopped howling and screaming. It was pleasant in the warm house. Laura and Mary did their lessons. Then Pa played the fiddle while Ma rocked and knitted and bean soup simmered on the stove. All night long the storm lasted and all the next day. Firelight danced out of the stove's draught and Pa told stories and played the fiddle. Next morning, the wind was only whizzing, and then the sun shone. Through the window, Laura saw snow scudding before the window and fast white swirls over the ground. The whole world looked like Plum Creek foaming in flood, only the flood was snow. Even the sunshine was bitter cold. Well, I guess the storm is over, said Pa. If I can get to town tomorrow, I am going to lay in a supply of food. Next day, the snow was in drifts on the ground. The wind blew only a smoke of snow up the sides and tops of the drifts. Pa drove to town and brought back big sacks of cornmeal, flour, sugar, and beans. It was enough food to last a long time. Seems strange to have to figure out where meat is coming from, Pa said. In Wisconsin, we always had plenty of bear meat and venison. And in Indian ter territory, there were deer and antelope and jackrabbits and turkeys and geese, all the meat a man could want. Here, there are only little cottontail rabbits. Well, we'll have to plan ahead and raise meat, said Ma. Think of how easy it would be to fatten our own meat, where we can raise such fields of grain for all the feed. Yes, said Pa. Next year, we will raise a wheat crop, surely. Next day, another blizzard came. Again, that low, dark cloud rolled swiftly up from the northwest till it blotted out the sun and covered the whole sky. And the wind went howling and shrieking and whirling. And snow went until it could be nothing but a blur of whiteness. Pa followed the rope to the stable and back. Ma cooked and cleaned and mended and helped Laura and Mary with their lessons. They did the dishes, made their beds, and swept the floors kept their hands and faces clean and neatly braided their hair. They studied their books and played with Carrie and Jack. They drew pictures on their slates and they taught Carrie to make her ABCs. Mary was still sewing nine patch blocks. Now Laura started a bare track quilt. It was harder than a nine patch because there were biased seams, very hard to make smooth. Every seam must be exactly right before Ma would let her make another. And often Laura worked several days on one short seam. So they were busy all day long. And all the days ran together with blizzard after blizzard. No sooner did one blizzard end with a day of cold sunshine than another began. On the sunny day, Pa worked quickly, chopping more wood, visiting the traps, pitching hay from the snowy stacks into the stable. Even though the sunny day was not Monday, Ma washed the clothes and hung them on the clothesline to freeze dry. That day, there were no lessons. Laura and Mary and Carrie, bundled stiff in their thick wraps, could play outdoors in the sunshine. Next day, another blizzard came, but Ma and Pa had everything ready for it. If the sunny day were Sunday, they could hear the church bell, 
clear and sweet, it rang through the cold, and they all stood outdoors and listened. They could not go to Sunday school. A blizzard might come before they could reach home. But every Sunday, they had a little Sunday school of their own. Laura and Mary repeated their Bible verses. Ma read a Bible story and a psalm. Then Pa played hymns on the fiddle, and they all sang. And then the next chapter is chapter 37. It's called The Long Blizzard. A storm was dying down at supper time one day, and Pa said, Tomorrow I'm going to town. I need some tobacco for my pipe, and I want to hear the news. Do you need anything, Caroline? No, Charles, said Ma. Don't go. These blizzards come up so fast. There'll be no danger tomorrow, said Pa. We just had a three-day blizzard. There's plenty of wood chopped to last through the next one, and I can make it, and I can take time to go to town now. Well, if you think it's best, Ma said, at least, Charles, promise me that you will stay in town if a storm comes up. I wouldn't try to stir a step without a safe hold on a rope in one of these storms, said Pa, but it's not like, but I, but it is not like you, Caroline, to be afraid to have me go anywhere. I can't help it, Ma answered. I don't feel right about your going. I have a feeling. It's just foolishness, I guess. Pa laughed. Oh, oh, I'll bring in the wood pile just in case I do have to stay in town. He filled the wood box and piled wood high around it. Ma urged him to put on an extra pair of socks to keep his feet from being frostbitten. So Laura brought the boot jack and Pa pulled off his boots and drew another pair of socks over those which he already wore. Ma gave him a new pair which she had finished knitted, which she had just finished knitting of thick, warm wool. I do wish you had a buffalo overcoat, said Ma. That old coat you have is worn so thin. And I do wish you had some diamonds, said Pa. Don't you worry, Caroline. It won't be long until spring. Pa smiled at them while he buckled the belt of his old threadbare overcoat and put on his warm felt cap. That winter is so bitter cold, Charles, Ma worried. Do pull down the ear laps. Not this morning, said Pa. Let the wind whistle. Now, you girls be good, all of you, till I get back. And his eyes twinkled at Laura as he shut the door behind him. After Laura and Mary had washed and wiped the dishes, swept the floor and made their beds and dusted, they settled down with their books. But the house was so cozy and pretty that Laura kept up looking up and around at it. The black stove was polished until it gleamed. A kettle of beans was bubbling on top and bread was baking in the oven. Sunshine slanted through the, shiny win the shining windows between the pink edged curtains. The red checked cloth was on the table. Beside the clock on the shelf stood Carrie's little brown and white dog and Laura's sweet jewel box. And the little pink and white shepherdess, shepherdess stood smiling on the wood brown bracket. Ma had brought her mending basket to her rocking chair by the window. Ma, while Ma rocked and mended, she heard Carrie say her letters in the primer. Carrie told big A and a little a, big B and a little b. Then she laughed and talked and looked at the pictures. She was still so little that she did not have to keep quiet and study. The clock struck 12. Laura watched the pendulum wang wagging and the black hands moving on the round white face. It was time for Pa to come home. The beans were cooked and the bread was baked and everything was ready for Pa's dinner. Laura's eyes strayed to the window. She stared a moment before she knew that something was wrong with the sunshine. Ma, she cried, the sun is a funny color. Ma looked up from her mending, startled. She went quickly into the bedroom where she could see the Northwest and she came back quietly. You may put away your books, girls, she said. Bundle up and bring in more wood. If Pa hasn't started home, he will stay in town and we will need more wood in the house. From the wood pile, Laura and Mary saw the dark cloud coming. They hurried, they ran, but there was time only to get into the house with their arm loads of wood before the storm came howling. It seemed angry that they had got the two loads of wood. Snow swirled so thickly that they could not see the doorstep, and Ma said, That will do for now. The storm can't get much worse, and Pa may come in a few minutes. Mary and Laura took off their wraps and warmed their cold, stiff hands. Then they waited for Pa. The wind shrieked and howled and jeered around the house. Snow swished against the blank windows. The long black hand of the clock moved slowly around its face. The short hand moved to the one, then to the two. Ma dished up three bowls of hot beans. She broke into pieces a small loaf of the fresh warm bread. Here, girls, she said, you might as well eat your dinner. 
Pa must have stayed in town. Ma had forgotten to fill a bowl for herself. Then she forgot to eat until Mary reminded her. Even then, she did not really eat. She said she was not hungry. The storm was growing worse. The house trembled in the wind. Cold crept over the floor, and powdery snow was driven in and around the windows and the doors that Pa had made so tight. Pa has surely stayed in town, said Ma. He will stay there all night. I better do the chores now. She drew on Pa's old, tall, stable boots. Her little feet were lost in those boots, but they would keep out the snow. She fastened Pa's jumper snug around her throat and belted it around her waist. She tied her hood on and put on her mittens. May I go with you, Ma? asked Laura. Oh, no, said Ma. Now listen to me. Be careful of fire. Nobody but Mary is to touch the stove, no matter how long I'm gone. Nobody is to go outdoors or even open the door until I come back. She hung the milk pail on her arm and reached through the whirling snow until she got a hold of the clothesline. She shut the back door behind her. Laura ran to the darkened window, but she could not see Ma. She could see nothing but the whirling whiteness squishing against the glass. The wind screamed and howled and gibbered. There seemed to be voices in it. And here's a picture of Ma going out to get the milk. So she's holding on to that rope for guidance so they don't get lost. Because if it's a whiteout, you can't tell where you are. And there's Laura trying to see her out the window. She's like, but she can't see her. Ma would go step by step, holding tight to the clothesline. She would come to the post and then go on, blind in the hard snow, whirling and scratching her cheeks. Laura tried to think slowly, one step at a time, till now, surely, Ma would have bumped against the stable door. Ma opened the door and blew in with the snow. She turned and pushed the door shut quickly and dropped the latch into its notch. The stable would be warm from the heat of the animals and steamy with their breath. It was quiet though. there. The storm was outside and the sod walls were thick. Now Sam and David turned their heads and whicked to Ma. The cow coaxed, moo, and the big calf cried, ah. The bullets were scratching here and there and one of the hens was saying to herself, cra, cra, cricker, cra. Ma would clean all the stalls with the pitchfork. Pitchfork by pitchfork, she th threw the old bedding onto the manure pile. Then she took the hay they had left in the mangers and spread it in to make clean beds. From the hay pile, she pitched fresh hay into the manger after manger until all four mangers were full. Sam and David and Spot and the calf munched on the good rustling hay. They were not very thirsty because Pa had watered them all before he went to town. With the old knife that Pa kept by the turnip pile, Ma cut up the turnips. She put some in each feed box and now the horses and cattle crunched on the crisp turnips. Ma looked at the hen's water dish to make sure they had water. She scattered a little corn for them and gave them a turnip to peck. Now she must be milking Spot. Laura waited until she was sure that Ma was hanging up the milking stool. Carefully fastening the stable door behind her, Ma came back toward the house holding tight to the rope, but she did not come. Laura waited a long time. She made up her mind to wait longer, and she did. The wind was shaking the house now. Snow as fine and grainy as sugar covered the windowsill and sifted off the floor and did not melt. Laura shivered in her shawl. She kept on staring at the blank window panes, hearing the swishing snow and howling, jeering winds. She was thinking of the children who Pa and Ma never came. They burned all the furniture and they still froze stark stiff, Pa had told them. Then Laura could be still no longer. The fire was burning well, but only the end of the room, that end of the room was really warm. Laura pulled the rocking chair near the open oven and set Carrie in it and straightened her dress. Carrie rocked in the chair while Laura and Mary went on waiting. At last, the back door burst open. Laura flew to Ma. Mary took the milk pail while Laura untied Ma's hood. Ma was too cold and breathless to speak. They helped her out of her jumper. The first thing she said was, is there any milk left? There was a little milk at the bottom of the pail and some frozen in the pails inside. The wind is terrible, Ma explained. She warmed her hands and then she lighted a lamp and set it on the windowsill. Why are you doing that, Ma? Mary asked. And Ma said, don't you think the lamp light's pretty shining against the snow outside? 
When she rested, they ate their supper of bread and milk. Then they all sat still by the stove and listened. They heard the voices howling and shrieking in the wind and the house creaking and the snow swishing. This will never do, said Ma. Let's play bean porridge hot. Mary, you and Laura play it together and Carrie, you hold up your hands. We'll do it faster than Mary and Laura can. So they all played bean porridge hot faster and faster until they could not say the rhymes for laughing. Then Mary and Laura washed the supper cups while Ma settled down to her knitting. Carrie wanted more bean porridge hot, so Mary and Laura took turns playing it with her. Every time they stopped, she shouted, more, more. The voices in the storm howled and giggled and shrieked and the house trembled. Laura was patting on Carrie's hands. Some like it hot, some like it cold, some like it in the pot, nine days. The stove shop, stove pipe sharply rattled. Laura looked up and screamed, Ma, the house is on fire. A ball of fire was rolling down the stovepipe. It was bigger than Ma Ma's big ball of yarn. It rolled across the stove and dropped to the floor as Ma sprang up. She snatched up her skirts and stamped on it, but it only seemed to jump through her foot and it rolled to the knitting she had dropped. Ma tried to brush it in the ash pan. It ran in front of her knitting needles, but it followed, to the, but it followed the needles back. Another ball of fire had rolled down the stovepipe and then another. They rolled across the floor with the knitting needles and did not burn the floor. My goodness, said Ma. While they watched those balls of rolling fire, suddenly there were only two. Then there were none. No one had seen where they went. That is the strangest thing I ever saw, said Ma, and she was afraid. All the hair on Jack's back was standing up. He walked to the door, lifted up his nose, and howled. Ma covered, cowered in her chair. I'm sorry. Mary cowered in her chair, and Ma put her hands over her ears. For pity's sake, Jack, hush, she begged him. Laura ran to Jack, but he did not want to be hugged. He went back to his corner and lay with his nose on his paws, his hair bristling, and his eyes shining in the shadow. Ma held Carrie, and Laura and Mary crowded into the rocking chair, too. Then they heard the wild voice of the storm and felt Jack's eyes shining until Ma said, Better run along to bed, girls. The sooner you're asleep, the sooner it will be morning. She kissed them goodnight, and Mary climbed up the, lower, the attic ladder. But Laura stopped halfway up. Ma was warming Carrie's nightgown by the oven. Laura asked in her low voice, Pa didn't stay in town, did he? Ma did not look up. She just said cheerfully, Why, surely, Laura. No doubt he and Mr. Fitch are sitting by the stove now, telling stories and cracking jokes. Laura went to bed. Deep in the night, she woke and saw lamplight shining up through the ladder hole. She crept out of bed into the cold, and kneeling on the floor, she looked down. Ma sat alone in her chair. Her head was bowed, and she was very still, but her eyes were open, looking at her hands clasped in her lap. The lamp was shining in the window. For a long time, Laura looked down, and Ma did not move. The lamp went on shining. The storm howled and hooted hooted after things that fled, shrieking through the enormous dark around the frightened house. At last, Laura crept silently back to bed and lay shivering.